Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to um, today's uh, six uh, research seminar. I'm Simon Wakeling, a, a lecturer here in the, the School of Information and Communication Studies, and I host these sessions on behalf of our school's uh, research committee. And, and thank you so much to everyone for attending. It's uh, lovely to see um, so many people here from not just CSU, but uh, other institutions um, as well. I'll begin by acknowledging the Wiradjuri, Gunawal, Gundagara and Birupai peoples of Australia, who are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which CSU's campuses are located uh, and pay respect to their elders, both past and present. Uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago to those who arrived uh, early that it, it's helpful for us to keep a record of, of uh, who's attending these sessions. So if you didn't mind um, and we're able to just pop a very, really quick intro into the, the chat, who you are and, and where you're from, um, that would be great. Um, so the format of the session is about uh, 40 to 45 minutes of, of presentation. Um, so we'll leave plenty of time for, for questions at the end. Um, feel free to put any questions you might have into the chat during the presentation. Presentation. I think Marianne and Danny and uh, Joanna are going to keep an eye on um, the chat and, and either come to those uh, questions as we go or address them at the end. Um, so today's seminar is titled Scholarly Communication Competencies and Analysis of Confidence Among Australasian Library Staff. Uh, and we have three presenters. Uh, Dr. Danny Kingsley is a thought leader in the international scholarly communication space. Uh, and I should add to that, and I, I, the term thought leader is sometimes used uh, a little bit, um, with a little bit suspiciously, I think, but uh, working in this area myself, I convinced that Danny definitely is a thought leader in this space. And uh, she's also Associate Librarian of Content and Digital Library Strategy at Flinders University uh, and a visiting fellow at the uh, Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. Um, Dr. Mary Ann Kennan uh, is Adjunct Associate Professor in the School of Information Studies at CSU. Um, technically retired, although doing a very good impression of a non-retired person by currently acting as course director um, in the school. Um, and she's a fellow of the uh, Australian Library and Information Association and editor of JALIA, Journal of Australian Library uh, and Information Association. And Dr. Joanna Richardson was the library strategy advisor at Griffith University until she retired in 2020. Um, previously, she was responsible for scholarly content and discovery services, including uh, repositories, research publications, and resource discovery. So that's definitely uh, enough from me. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for coming. And I'll hand over to uh, Marianne, Danny, and Joanna. Excellent. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, and while um, Marianne's pulling up the slides, um, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm on the uh, lands of the Yagara people in Brisbane. So I pay my respects to... Ma Marianne, you've got the wrong screen showing uh, in your email at the moment. Who should... That's fascinating. How, should... <laughs> How did I manage that? I apologise, everybody. If you get stuck, let me know. I can make mine. Is that the correct one? That's the one. Yeah, that's it. Great. Um, excellent. Okay, so today what we're talking about is um, the we're, we're describing the the process we went through to do this research project and the findings from the research project, which where the paper is called "Scholarly Communication Competencies and Analysis of Confidence Amongst Australasian Library Staff." So we'll move on to the next slide. Sorry. Ah. There we go. Okay, great. So um, first of all, the, the, we thought it would be good to give you some background about why we've gone ahead with this study. Um, so what, what we've anecdotally and um, observed and also uh, realised through research and um, literature is that the, the number and range of scholarly communication related roles in academic libraries and elsewhere have been growing quite steadily over the past uh, 20 years, nearly 20 years. But what is an observation that's been happening over that time is a, a lack of formal education and training in scholarly communication. Um, and uh, 
I, I discovered this when I went over to the UK and I, one of the first things I did was go to a Force 11 um, conference and the skills came up and I sort of mentioned that it wasn't, scholarly communication wasn't being taught in Australian, uh, very much in Australian degrees and uh, American colleagues were saying, well, it's neither for us. And then the, the UK colleagues were saying, well, neither for us. So it seemed to be a, a, a sort of a, a problem that's sort of worldwide. Um, then, then towards the end of uh, 20, no, during the, I'm getting confused about dates, it was before the bloody pandemic, um, there was a study that, that, was, that came out um, about imposter phenomenon and, um, and in people working in scholarly communication. And I sent it around to two different lists. One was the, uh, the uh, repository community in the UK and the CARES list, which is, um, is the call um, Australian Institutional Repository Support Service list. Um, so people working in Skullcom, I said, oh, this is interesting. And in both cases, individuals got back to me and said, oh, we should do that here because I feel that way. So it seemed like there was something going on. And so that then hence the decision to sort of investigate our area, our local um, area here in Australia and in New Zealand. So uh, here's some examples of the kind of work that's happened in the past looking at this area. The first one is a study from the UK. It was I did it with my colleague Claire Sewell when we were at Cambridge, um, where we had a, 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 a hypothesis coming partly out of work that we'd done by Research Libraries UK on um, this sort of a skills gap. Um, that, that was being really obviously identified, in, particularly in relation to research data management. Um, but we were saying that, that we were concerned that there was a potential time bomb about um, happening if we weren't going to do something about this, because in the UK, the things were accelerating a lot faster. Um, we got about 500 responses to that from all around the world. It was, was a much higher response rate than we ever anticipated. But there are two other studies that also kind of informed this uh, position, which was one was the one I described there in the middle as the imposter phenomenon study came out of the US and um, there's also another US study that was saying um, that uh, the question about um, formal training in scholarly communications is in, in, um, in this area is rare and so it, it causes a problem for people starting out. So what we did was um, we, we started with the imposter phenomenon study and originally we were in correspondence with the author of that work and, and she sent over her, um, her in survey instrument and initially we were going to just replicate that survey instrument um, so that we could have a comparison point with her work. However, when we looked at some of the competencies that she had put into hers, she had primarily used the NASIG um, uh, competency. So that's that, that one there in the top. Um, but there is another set of competencies in relation to scholarly communication, um, which was done by a joint task force of um, different members of the community. So um, we've just, on this particular slide, um, pointed out that earlier until December 2020, um, the, the competencies there didn't mention anything that had any relationship to scholarly communication. The new ones do. Um, but if you just go back one, if that's possible, Marianne, I don't know if I'm going to be challenging your um, navigational skills. Back one, forward one. Forward. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Um, so what we did was we uh, did an analysis. Uh, we ran the uh, the two, the NASIC one and the Joint Task Force one, and I did a comparative analysis about which competencies were held um, in which, and uh, worked out because there was some some which were sort of a bit uh, sort of American. It was in relation to having judicial understanding or understanding of the judicial environment or something, which sort of wasn't really relevant in our space. So did a pretty comprehensive uh, uh, contrast and compare, uh, which we've made available at that URL, and came up with these eight areas of, uh, of competencies. And it's very small writing there, so I'm not expecting you to read them, but, the, um, but there were the, basically our seven headings plus personal strengths, um, and then there was particular tasks associated underneath those. So, so our definition of scholarly communication came from that process. And so our headline tasks um, are these, these ones here, which are institutional repository management, publishing services, research practice, copyright services, OA policies, and the landscape data management and assessment and impact me metrics. Um, now, we publishing services, which just so that people understand what we're talking about, um, include knowledge of publishing platforms, the publishing lifecycle, minting identifiers like digital object identifiers, metadata schema, technical support, system administration and programming and assessment. And research practice includes knowledge of publishing workflows and operational models, 
editorial processes, traditional and emerging scholarly publishing models, uh, training researchers in publishing processes and in choosing a publishing outlet, the ability to identify a predatory journal, and um, and and I've got a note here from from Marianne who's saying academics are not our not not the group here, but um, uh, don't like being trained by librarians. And um, and as a practicing librarian, she's always suggested librarians use other words for this process. Um, so yeah, so that's research practice. That's how we defined it. So moving on. Oh, is there a question there? No, no, no I'm sorry. I, I'm supposed to use page down, but it's not working, which means that sometimes I have to roll too far. There you go, Danny. That's the next right. one. OK, so that, that then brought us to our study, and was, which was primarily undertaken in 2020 and 2021, even though we're talking about it in 2022 and the final publication won't actually be appear in, in, in print or on screen to November 2022, which does speak something to the length of the research publication process, but that's a different story. Um, so what we did was we created a web page on the Australian, I was the lead um, investigator, so we ran our ethics and so on through ANU. Um, and so we put up a web page on the um, Australian Centre for the National Awareness of Science, which is where I'm a visiting fellow, which just talked about the about the study and what we were hoping to achieve. And also there was a link to the, the questions, uh, the list of questions there so that people could see what the questions were going to be prior to starting the survey. We have made all of the materials available. So the authors accepted manuscript. We have permission to make that available. So that is online. And we've also made our supporting data sets um, and also that comparison of competencies available online as well. And this, these slides also. Um, so um, we've been as fair as we can possibly be. So this is a summary and it's lots of words there and they're very small um, of our research process. Um, so. Primarily, we were asking questions about um, people's confidence. Like once we did, determined what the what the competencies were in this area, what people's confidence was in uh, undertaking those tasks, and then we also wanted to know what their education and training background was. So, in some ways, we were melding together the imposter phenomenon study that was done in the US and the educational background study that was done in the UK um, together into one study. We used Qualtrics. Um, we recruited through communication mediums used by the target cohort, like um, discussion lists and uh, Twitter and so on. We received our responses at the end of 2020, between the 21st of October and the 3rd of December. Um, we had an issue because the ethics panel asked that no questions other than I do you agree to participate could be compulsory. And that meant that not all questions were answered. And so that also meant that even though we had a, a 160 one uh, responses, we didn't have 161 responses for all questions. So that meant that um, Joanna did an enormous amount of work going through and actually establishing what the, what the number of responses was for each of the questions so that we could then work out things like percentages and so on. Um, and that, that analysis is part of the data set that we've made available. So we had, a, sorry, 160, I apologize, uh, valid responses. Um, we used Excel and descriptive statistics for the quantitative questions and in vivo and manual thematic coding for the qualitative ones. And we each, each member of the team undertook um, a responsibility for analysis of a different question, but we then went back and cross-checked each other's work in terms of coding and so on. And uh, the, because it was a matrix, so you can start to think about the complexity of this, we've got, we've got seven areas um, and we have um, multiple tasks within that area. Um, so we've suddenly, we've, we start to have a very large number of uh, data points. And so what, in, for the purposes of this, what we were trying to establish here um, in terms of the general overall level of confidence, what we did was we pulled together the all of the tasks in each competency. So ended up with a number for each competency. Um, it, it's quite complicated to try and explain this. It would be a bit clearer when you see the graph. So that was our method. So of our responses, we've got here of the um, Australian and New Zealand responses, you can see there the um, number of responses is the orange on the left-hand side and the blue is the number of universities in that, that cohort. So you can see that we've got a disproportionately large number of responses from New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria. Um, however, it, otherwise it does more or less kind of match um, the, the responses. So we didn't have anywhere where we didn't get responses for. There were a couple of institutions. We did ask people for their institutions, which we've de-identified back out of the uh, data set. So that was how we were able to establish this information. 
Um, we've got 35.1% were at um, Hue Level 6, which is a, a, an Australian uh, level of, um, of employment, um, and 58.2% at Hue 7 and above. The way we asked the question around New Zealand, as none, none of us were not were native New Zealanders, was non, not clear to the New Zealanders, so we weren't actually able to get information for New Zealand in terms of their levels. The thing that we found quite interesting, and this was reflected in, in both the um, the the impulsive phenomenon and also the UK study is, uh, so this is sort of now, we've got triangulation on this, is that these roles are generally less than 10 years old uh, in scholarly communication. However, the length of time people have been working in, in libraries is inversely proportional. Um, so we, so that we've got the, the blue is the number the time you've worked in a library and the red is the time you've worked in your role in scholarly communication. So you can see that the, the, the orange or the red is very heavily weighted towards the shorter period of time and the length of libraries is weighted more towards the longer length of time. Can have the next study, next page. Uh, so I think we need to go one back. Yeah, okay, so here's the graph that sort of has everything um, compiled together. So for each, uh, each competency area, this is the collective uh, responses in terms of confidence or not, not, not confidence across the different tasks in that competence. Competency it gets very confusing when you start talking about this. Um, so you can see the different colours represent uh, from the left hand side of blue is a great deal of confidence through to the uh, the other darker blue, which is no confidence at all. Um, and in some instances, it's not applicable. And so if you just look at this at first glance, it's sort of looking okay. You sort of think, oh, it's not too bad. You know, um, we've got a lot of, like number four, a lot is quite high in quite a few of those. Um, so that was our initial sort of view. And then we started really looking at the numbers. And it turns out that um, there were only two competency areas where the majority of the confidence levels are a great deal or a lot, and that's in open access policies and SCOLCOM landscape and assessment and impact metrics. But the two competency areas where the positive confidence levels were considerably lower were publishing services and data management services. And we did find this a bit surprising because data management services is something that has actually been happening for a while in, in Australia. So then we ask people, why do you, what, what, what are the factors yet? Yeah, that's right, thank you, moving on to the next. And what are the factors that um, are causing you to not feel confident? And, and we reflect uh, the imposter phenomenon study here in terms of the, what, the, the different options here for why people feel that they were not, um, don't feel confident. And the, um, the question about, uh, I need more time and experience and I've got too many responsibilities. So that's the green at the top and the yellow sort of through the middle constitutes pretty much almost half of all of those answers. So there's a time factor here, which is quite significant for all of the respondents in terms of I'm, I'm not able to feel confident because I don't have enough time to stay up to date. And that's, that's obviously its own problem. Um, but then we need to start thinking about, well, how can they stay up to date? So I think this is where I hand over to you, Mary Anderson. Um, uh, not quite yet. But okay, I I'll keep talking. <laughs> but I, I, on this slide, I did want to add that um, the other is also quite big. That's the sort of blue in the middle. And that um, is an area that could have more teasing out because it's uh, where it's either not a core part of the person's role. So a person might work in one aspect of scholarly communication like data management and be really on top of that, but not know uh, much about the other areas. Um, the other was that people, quite a, quite a few people said that they were supervisors or managers, so they only had an overview. They didn't understand the in-depth detail of the areas, which was quite interesting. Um, and uh, that other parts of the university have responsibility for areas, for example, research office might do impact and assessment, legal might do copyright, and IT might do systems admin and data management. But this was different across all the, all the respondents. Sorry, so Lucy's made the observation that um, too many responsibilities is also a major factor. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah, speaking yeah. to that time question, we um, we talked we we talked about what 
aspects of the of the, our findings we, we'd sort of focus on today. Um, there is a whole other presentation that we will we'll be pulling together, which looks at the question about um, how how scholarly communication is perceived in institutions and supported by institutions and libraries, and what those roles mean and what that means strategically. Um, so that's a, that's a, another complete aspect of and, and is discussed in the the paper. Um, but today we're primarily focusing on the educational and training aspect, given the audience that we have here today. So um, so yeah, there's. But there's a lot more, but when you've got to squish it into a short time, we've got to um, we've got to uh, choose what we what we focus on. So one of the observations that that um, has come from this is a Finnish study that was done in 2020, um, and they were looking at how do they prepare, how do they prepare their um, their community to be ready to manage scholarly communication sort of challenges over time. And, and, and what they made the note was that um, this is open science, uh, which is we use the term open research here because um, science does enc encompass. Um, humanities and social sciences, but it's not seen that way in the UK and Australia. So, um, so we use a broader term, but it, open science does encompass them in um, over, overseas in Europe. Um, so they're saying it would require an expansion of traditional library services and the adoption of new roles. Um, and also the, the development of these services and tools will require qualifications beyond those of traditional library skills. And the way, um, one way of thinking about this is that uh, what we're talking about in relation to this aspect of open, open research, open science, is that it's being involved in the, the production of research. So rather than simply the consumption of information, we're actually being involved in the process of producing it. Not necessarily producing it ourselves, um, although that can happen, but uh, in, in, certainly in terms of supporting the production of research directly. So that is a new, a new thing for us to be managing. Right, this is, this is you, isn't it? This is where I take over. And I'd like to, first of all, pay my respects to uh, the elders of the lands where I am. I'm in, um, on Wongal land of the Eora Nation, um, which is also known as Croydon in New South Wales. And I'm going to be talking about formal education. I'd also like to thank Danny very much because Danny put the slides together and all these gorgeous photographs and, and design uh, her work, um, as well as uh, the content. And Joanna and I just did little tweaky, tweaky bits at the end. So thanks, Danny. So um, uh, I just need to check because my thing is not working well. Here we go. That should be the first one. Um, so we did ask how many of our respondents had a library and information science qualification given that they were all working in SCOLCOMs. Um, and you might have noticed from Danny's original slide that some of them weren't in university libraries. So there were a few replies from other research organisations as well, but mostly uh, university libraries. So 88%, um, 141, held an LIS qualification. 1.8%, 33, were studying for, for such a qualification and only 10% did not hold an LIS qualification. So, you know, we assume that they sort of specialists in some of those other things that we uh, talked about earlier on, that Danny talked about earlier on. And the length of time we felt was interesting as well. Um, so uh, look at the huge number of people who've been working in libraries for 20 plus years there. Um, and there are still, uh, um, some uh, people who've been working in libraries less time, but presumably a lot of those 20 plus years people are going to be retiring soon. And so there might be more, more roles coming up in the near future. Other research in other areas has said the same thing. Oops. So um, one of the things we thought was really interesting was that we asked them how their LIS qualification had equipped them for scholarly communication work. And 57.4% said no. And even some of the ones that said yes qualified their yes. Um, so um, there were 92 comments. So a lot of people also felt that they needed to explain their answer um, in this thing, which was interesting to us as well. And so 25 respondents noted that scholarly communication knowledge knowledge and skills were not included in their degree at all. And the comments were like, 
barely touched on scholarly communication issues. The course itself didn't teach me about anything of what I actually do at work, and it's been a really steep learning curve. Uh, my qualification felt overly basic and general, not offering much depth about the complexities of scholarly communication, emerging platforms, changing landscape in university libraries, etc. And um, we don't know where these people did their qualifications from, but you know these comments were quite the overwhelming sort. Interestingly, this seems to be carrying through because the um, other another comment we got is with someone who works with work placement students now, right now, and that person said that uh, their experience is that the work placement students don't have a great insight into scholarly communications either. And this is a crying shame, not just for their own professional development, but for the industry. We need graduates who are aware of the big issues and have knowledge of the emerging and current issues in scholarly communications. Just look at the impact COVID had on publishing. Okay. Um, so in addition to those comments, we, um, have a highly, and the, the LIS qualifications that people have, we have a highly educated cohort because 83, 81.3% had a qualification other than LIS. So, and, and below, these are the types of degrees that the people other had other than LIS. So diploma or advanced diploma is the TAFE. Um, uh, and bachelor degrees, graduate diplomas, and master's degrees, and also doctorates. So um, we're not dealing, we're dealing with people who, who have good uh, education and qualifications. So the other thing we asked um, for participants about was their research background, whether they had been um, involved in research in one way or another. And we couldn't fully report these questions because something went wrong with the survey despite our pilot testing. And, um, and um, but we did get some of the, um, uh, we were able to do some work around this. So some people had got research through, you know, the formal way, um, the PhD, but a lot of others had it through um, practical experience of conducting workplace research and writing articles about it with their colleagues. So this was, interestingly, um, health librarians really stood out in, in this regard as doing the practical um, work, uh, which we reported, the practical research, which we reported in a little article we wrote in Health Libraries Australia or something. So, um, these comments are typical of the ones from respondents with a research background. Um, my favourite is part of the problem librarians face in this area is the you know, issue that universities are hierarchical institutions where the PhD is a piece of cultural capital that is often necessary to be taken seriously by academics. But this person says, I don't think my PhD makes me a better librarian. It just makes them think I am. Um, that's, that's interesting. And also, uh, it's an evolving and changing landscape where qualification does not necessarily equip you with the knowledge required to be professionally active in this area and continuously build knowledge are required to effectively work in the scholarly communication environment. And I think all of those of us who are here who've worked in that environment know that to be a common feeling. I understand firsthand that the scholarly writing and I understand firsthand the scholarly writing and publishing process, although I have learned more about research metrics and journal rankings as a professional staff member than I did when I was research active. We we'll come to some of that a little bit later. So how have the respondents gained their skills? So we did ask them, um, you know, uh, how people got their skills if they didn't, particularly if they didn't get it in their um, formal education. And we felt we needed to describe what we meant by these areas because 
um, we ourselves had to tease this out in our heads uh, when we were developing the survey. Um, so we looked at the literature and we discussed it with, uh, between ourselves and with our colleagues. So we came to define formal training as referring to courses with a structured plan that have some formal recognition upon completion. For example, a participation certificate or some other sort of certification. Um, professional development, uh, referring to training related to your job that did not lead to any formal recognition. For example, supervisor or colleague assisted training, live or virtual classes, conference sessions and webinars and so on. And then self-directed learning or what a lot of people call just staying up to date, which refer, uh, refer to a form of study in which um, you're largely responsible, uh, in which you are to a large extent responsible for your own instruction. <laughs> um, I don't, I obviously didn't write that because it didn't come clearly to me. So but I hope that's clear to, to, to you listeners. Um, okay, so um, this is uh, interesting. Formal training is not where skills are currently acquired. Um, I'm going to explain what the little adjusted under formal training is a little bit on a later slide. Um, but we can see that the yes responses for formal training are only 10%. Um, professional development is much uh, much higher. Um, so um, I think, you know, that's something interesting to hold on uh, at this stage as we move forward here. Come on, my internet's not working. Here we go. So um, this reflects uh, the UK study Danny talked about earlier where mostly um, what is learned about this particular area is on the job or self-directed learning. And um, uh, there's a link there if anyone wants to look at uh, the, the report of this research from the UK. So um, this is with, but they look more specifically at uh, current needs and future needs. And the um, formal education is the green, on the job training is the blue, and self-directed learning is the, is the uh, gold or yellow. So, you know, um, on the job training and self-directed learning are uh, much the highest. So congratulations to everybody who, who does that, you know, often themselves and in their own time. So um, when I said that the figures were adjusted in that previous graph about our particular respondents, this is despite um, us putting what we thought the, the definitions, you know, in a place that people had to read before they answered the questions on the survey, um, people did get um, them uh, mixed up, the different, you know, self-directed formal training and professional development. And we know this because we asked them for examples um, in an open question. And so several respondents nominated 23 research things as formal training, but in fact, it is self-directed learning. Um, it's something that people do in their own time, don't get any uh, certification or whatever for. And one respondent nominated Leiden's, Leiden University's course on bibliometrics and science, scientometrics um, as professional development, but it is in fact formal training. Um, so of the 32 people who responded, yes, at least 14 uh, to, to uh, at least four, four to, that they had formal training, at least 14 were not formal training or certification courses. And so that's why we adjusted the graph earlier. It's highly probable that some of the respondents who chose yes but did not comment may have also had in mind courses or training which do not meet the formal training criteria for this survey, or I might add, as I've learned, as course director for credit in, in a course, it needs to have some sort of um, formal criteria.
apologies for this. I thought it would be smart doing it on uh, from our Dropbox site, which um, and Danny and I would both be able to share the screen, but uh, we can't. So, um, so uh, in um, self-directed learning, the landscape is what all the respondents were telling us that it's a fast-moving and diverse area, quick-moving you know, space which changes rapidly. That was just a constant through pretty much all the responses where people had a chance to put in something um, in their own words. Um, the perceived value of conference attendance is really high. And remembering this was done, a uh, survey was done before we knew how long um, COVID might affect conference attendance. So we imagine that people are really missing this and while it, you know, the content is often um, available to be done uh, online or attended online, there's other sorts of benefits of conference attending, such, such as network and all those other things are not happening. That there's also really strong engagement with um, organisations such as OA Australasia and the ARDC. Uh, Liz, I saw that you were here. Um, so, um, uh, that was an interesting thing. But 68% spend less than two hours per week uh, on self-directed learning. And we might um, attribute that, you know, if we think back when Danny was talking about time being such a major factor for people, it's, um, it's, it's a huge thing. So people are often working more than more hours than, you know, they technically should in inverted commas. Um, so one of the first things to go uh, seems to be your own uh, self-directed learning. So I don't know if that slide is um, the, it's visible to you all, but journal and conferences is, is the top thing for self-directed learning, blogs, grey literature, Twitter, listservs, open courses, LinkedIn, podcasts, other, wikis. Um, some people do know self-directed learning and um, audio books. So, yeah. Notice Danny's put in, um, if everyone's looking at the chat, uh, while we wait for the slide, this speaks to our collective understanding is what expectations are of our community in terms of background and active ongoing knowledge. So, at this point, I'm handing back to Danny. Okay, so um, so what we have, or what we see, we as the authors of this paper see, is that um, there is there is a less than ideal situation. What what we have is um, groups of people who are coming in uh, from their degrees without uh, awareness sometimes at all of any of this area. Um, it's a growing area, but we don't have analyses of, um, Simon, I think it was, I put something in the chat saying what percentage of, oh, Scott, sorry, um, put something about what percentage of uh, LIS graduates go into um, academic librarianship. Um, and he's also put some stats from the Bureau of Statistics. Um, and it looks like of about 10,000, um, and I don't know what year that was, I can't remember, I only looked at it briefly, um, it was over 1,000 uh, that went into, um, it was the third highest one. Um, and there is also one relating to research services, which is further down as well. So it's a not insignificant number. Um, and then what we don't have statistics on um, is what, what the changing nature is of the workforce within our libraries at the moment, our academic libraries. And so we know we've got fewer catalogues, for example, but, but that's just anecdotal. We haven't got sort of got the numbers on this, but it's scholarly communication is growing and it's going to grow more. So we... Uh, We've, we've got an issue where we need to have a group of people who've got some skill sets and how they're going to get them. Um, so the, well, there's clearly an opportunity for us collectively as a community to improve. Um, so we noted that one, one of the frustrations expressed about the LAS qualifications could have reflected the fact that prior to December 2020, Alia's foundation, um, community, foundation knowledge skills and attributes relevant to information professionals working in archives, libraries and records management, uh, which is the basis on which degrees are kind of structured, they must meet those uh, foundational skills, did not mention scholarly communication skills, including basic ones like copyright. 
that has changed as of December 2020. Um, however, of course, there's, there, there will be a um, period of time as those uh, courses are adapted and uh, to reflect those new skills. And of course, those courses then need to go through the approval processes and so on and so forth. So there will be a lag. And, and of course, those students need to come through and do the courses and then graduate and, and then get into employment. So we do have a sort of group of people who are currently working um, or just about to finish their degrees who we're going to have to you know, help. Um, so one thing that we could could help is that the uh, LIS education programs do start including the scholarly communications issues uh, more explicitly to their programs. So that's one solution. It is not the only solution, though. So uh, Marianne, if you can jump on. Uh, so some of the things that the, that the respondents sort of suggested in terms of things that they would like to see um, is uh, sort of some sort of structured professional development and training. So this is something which is not static. Uh, it is constantly moving. Um, and so it is, it is something that is more, more naturally um, naturally helped by professional development um, and it would be great to have some sort of process that's recognized by professional organizations like ALIA or ARMS which is the Australian Research, Research Management Society um, so bearing in mind that depending on the institution and certainly in the UK um, quite often scholarly communication uh, does, it doesn't sit in the library or I at Cambridge initially had a double report I reported to the university librarian and also to the head of the research office in some instances the people who are working in this space are actually in the research office so um, it is it is something that spans across both of those areas uh, so that's why we're talking about the Australian Research Management Society um, having community of practice and Australasian capacity building programs or initiatives we do have the legacy of, of cares um, the, uh, which is the calls uh, Australasian Institution Re Repository Support Service. Um, that, that is a smaller list now, a discussion list. Um, uh, there is a community of practice that's just being started up to manage read and publish agreements, which is again, a subset of what we're talking about here. So we, we do need something that is uh, encompasses the bigger picture, the broader questions. Um, and we also need some national level changes um, through existing professional organisations as mentioned above, or developing a new professional organisation of some description that's scholarly communication focused. So where do we go from here? So we are maintaining that the situation is suboptimal, uh, but the question is, and this is what we want to open the floor now to discussion, so happy to answer questions obviously about the, the study itself, but also really would like a um, discussion about potential ways forward. Uh, where does the responsibility lie? Um, it's, it's not simply the responsibility of the developers of uh, LIS degrees, nor the responsibility of individual institutions, um, or, the, or even the library sector alone. I, th I think this is, this is a very big issue. Um, so it's not simple, and we really are welcoming all discussion. Any suggestions, any offerings would be greatly uh, appreciated. So that's the end of our sort of formal presentation -y part. Um, so, I don't know, Simon, are you going to run the discussion? Well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll keep out of the way, but I can certainly uh, get us started. I noticed that Eleanor um, just added something to the chat. I don't know whether you might want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, she finishes with the question, will there be less importance put on on the job Skullcom's training because it will be assumed that people have learned via formal qualification? I, I guess that's if um, uh, LIS graduate um, higher degrees start to include scholarly communications uh, elements to them. Yeah, and you've um, made an observation there, sorry to, um, to interrupt there, but that um, the recent survey of LAS graduates admittedly from a small base uh, found that 28% had gone into an academic library position. So if we, if we are making the position, making the case that academic libraries are, are quite different from other types of libraries because of this issue about really having to manage scholarly communication, then if it's, a, if it's nearly a third of the participants in the course, then clearly there is a need there. Mm. And I'd like to add that it's not just academic librarians, it's people in hospitals and healthcare. It's yeah. people at places like CSIRO and the Antarctic Research Organisation, uh, library staff uh, who are in all those organisations and probably others that we're not even aware of who need to have this kind of uh, background as well. 
Okay, so Lucy's put Lucy's put a debate piece forward in the in the discussion. Do you want to stop sharing, Marianne, so then we can all practice? Sure. Together? Yeah. Um, so Lucy has, has said this should be the responsibility of individuals that are supported by their library institutions. So that's that's a that's a position to put forward and discuss. I know what I know, know what I my opinion on that, but I'd be really happy to hear others. And I should add as well, if people want to unmute themselves and discuss, then they mm. should feel free. We automatically muted everyone just to start the meeting, but um, it'd be good to get discussion going if people want to. Yeah, just to um, elaborate further, um, for example, you know, uh, doctors will continue to supplement their their knowledge and their information by reading articles similar to what's been what's come out in this survey. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's one approach, but if we need some sort of structured training, if people are time poor, I mean, one option is that they go and learn this information off site in some sort of formal structured training, um, relying on, on, if they're time poor, relying on them to go, just go ahead and do it. I don't think it's going to work. Yeah, I agree. Um, Cause I, I put the case forward, particularly now, we're dealing with things like read, read and publish and, and we really, really have not at all started addressing what the implications of that are in the bigger picture as a, as a community. Um, the, the, the landscape is, is changing and we are under enormous threat as a, as a uh, profession from publishers. Um, so th this, this is a big issue and one that really fundamentally is going to shift what, what I mean, what is an academic library in an open access world? Mm. Having that conversation. So mm. we really need to be doing this, uh, you know, to, to, I understand what you're saying there, but I think we, we, we need to get to some sort of base level um, where it's not up to the individual to get to the base level. That's, uh, it, uh, that's, 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 that's probably where we're, that's probably what we're talking about is, you know, and not all people working in academic libraries are dealing with this particular stuff. So what, where, where do we want everyone to be at from which you can then become a specialist in research data or a specialist in whatever, I think is probably, I think the position we're putting forward or the, the discussion point. Yeah, I kind of uh, agree. I agree with Danny. Um, I think that there should be uh, basic education in this, but because as everyone has mentioned, it's a rapidly changing field, there should be um, uh, some responsibility on uh, employers to help their staff keep up to date, as well as some individual responsibility. So I think it's a combination of all the, all the, the things um, that really is going to um, uh, is, is going to make the situation better. That's my personal view. So we've got a, um, uh, and, and Rebecca's made the observation about the um, issue of too many responsibilities and not enough time is going to impact this goal. And that's exactly what, um, what Marianne was just speaking to, I think about this, that we need to take this, this, this is the other presentation that we need to take this seriously, strategically as a, as a sector um, and understand that you know, the roles need to be less fragmented and that, that, that there needs to be allowance of time to the way you stay, a way to stay up to date on the cutting edge stuff is, of course, conversations that we're having right now. Um, and so uh, being allowed time to, to attend um, sessions and so on, of course, we've got the problem in Australia of being completely out of whack time-wise with where, with where a lot of the conversations are actually occurring, um, which is a hassle. But nonetheless, it doesn't mean we can't have them ourselves. Mm. And there's some really interesting um, comments in the chat. And it's, I've been trying to keep up with them, and it's really hard. Um, so thanks, everyone, for those. Uh, we'll look forward to sort of unpacking them a bit yeah, if we can't get them here. But um, so I think, I mean, Kylie says that there's a specialist versus generalist debate. And so, yes, that's true. So maybe um, I'm thinking in an education space because that's where I've spent the last you know, 10 or 12 years, um, I was a practitioner before that, but is that, um, uh, you know, in education, we might have a core, which is an overview that gives people the background and then electives, which, which uh, people can delve down into, you know, a specific area like research data management or something. And um, so, 
it's uh, same with professional development might work the same way and community practice might work the same way where there's specialist and generalist areas. Um, uh, sorry, you're, you, you're contributing so, it's a, it's <laughs> so quickly, I can't keep up to somebody else going. I mean, <laughs> It's effectively the same approach for any discipline, right? Mm. Where you have that generalist approach that gives you the basis to understand where your passions lie. Mm. And, uh, and the specialist approach is delving deep into your passions. Yes? Um, so I've been lucky enough to be able to follow my passions <laughs> wherever they've taken me. Um, and, and that's research data management. Mm. Um, and I've, I've learnt most of what I know through talking to researchers as I've, as I've been lucky enough to be in CSIRO. So, um, yeah, most of it has not come from, from formal qualifications, which are <clears throat> old now, yeah, old. <laughs> yeah. But how do we recognise that? Sorry, I just, no, excuse me. Someone uh, had made the point that, and we mentioned it on an earlier slide, it may have been Danny, about, I think the question is, was how do we get academic slash researchers to better appreciate the, well, I'm not sure it's qualifications. I mean, it was fun to stand up, you know, in a, in a department meeting somewhere at school when you represent the library and be introduced as Dr. Richardson, yeah, right, well, yeah. So I played that game because it, <laughs> you understand that you want to get a foot in the door. But I think um, that, that issue, of course, is across the library as a whole. Now, I would just point out, someone may want to go and have a, a bit of a look at that. There's some interesting uh, studies and some interesting writing specifically in that area. How do you engage with, say, researchers or academics uh, to, you know, the term partner? Now, everyone may be over the term partner. <laughs> But it, it, it is, uh, and there's some very interesting approaches. Uh, so I would just commend, rather than just looking specifically at skull columns, is look across libraries as a whole and have a look at some of the initiatives which academic libraries have used successfully to make that uh, bridge, you know, and actually partner with academics. Sorry, Danny. <laughs> Uh, I agree, and that 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 is um, probably something we'll kind of tease out in the in the partner presentation whenever that will be about that aspect about why this is strategic for institutions and how we sort of cross across to, across the institution. Um, but I was thinking in relation to Anne's comment about the kind of the the her uh, gaining of knowledge over time in the area that she's taken on to herself. We don't have any way of recognizing that. That's another thing, sort of, and, and this is something that we, um, I've encountered a couple of times just recently where I've, I've published an article which is talking about a call for um, developing standards in research practice training, that if we understand what it is we're supposed to be supporting the researchers in, then we know what we ourselves need in terms of our skill sets, uh, in which where the reviewer asked me to kind of justify myself, my interest in this, and why, why should anyone listen to me? And then we kind of got a similar query in the, um, the review of this paper, which was sort of, you need to explain who you are and where you're coming from. So there's this kind of accusational, who are you to say this? Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, oh, well, no, I think I know quite a lot about this, um, but we don't mm -hmm. sort of have a, we don't have a formal way of saying that in a lot of ways. So it, it does, it does make it a bit challenging because we've always, I've often talked to colleagues about, it's not common to put on your application for a job or your CV that you've attended all these conferences, but that's actually the way you've found a lot of stuff out. <laughs> so how do we, how do we even kind of articulate a, a sort of that you, you know, stuff. Mm. Mm. I, I agree with you. That's challenging. Put it, I, the best I can do is put it in a bio when I'm, when I'm doing something at a conference, which I haven't done for a few years now. Right. <laughs> so. <laughs> mm. Okay, what are some of the other queries? Um, about, about promoting ourselves. Yes, I, th I think so. I think that um, I, 
actually think that the scholarly communication issue and in fact the whole read and publish question um, does open up an opportunity to have quite a different conversation with our researchers. Um, so I was speaking to one this morning um, and trying to explain uh, some of how it all works and what, what, what's involved and what it means and issues that, that the broader question. We're talking about money because I figure they, they do at least get money. Um, and then he started talking about, but does open access increase citations? And I said, well, yeah, it does. And there's a debate about which versions increase it by which, which level and so on. And I said, but if you start to think about the proportion of citations of work versus the readership, you know, like I know with a study I did at Cambridge with one publisher, there was about 3,000 citations in a given year of their work and about 600,000 reads of it. And uh, so, you know, clearly the readership is very high compared to the citations. And he said, um, but, you know, we need to, what we measured on is citations. And I said, well, why are you doing your research? Is it for citations or is it so that your work gets read by the wider community? And let me tell you, the answer is the second one. Um, and then he said, but that's what we measured on. But that's a problem because that's what. We, and so he, it was I felt like a, 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 um, a counsellor, you know, when somebody's just answering their own questions in, in, in us beginning that conversation, he suddenly started to himself unpick all the sort of research culture issues, the way we, we, we um, reward research and the problems that that's causing and so on and so forth. So this, this, brings, this gives us an opportunity as an expert in a particular aspect of SCOLCOM to really start opening up those questions and those discussions across campus. So we're not going in them saying, we know this and we're going to train you in a training session, which they really don't like. It's a conversation. And I think that, that, that this gives us an opportunity to have that conversation. Yep, and Lucy uh, is suggesting that library representation on more committees and so on. Absolutely, 100%. Oh, definitely, definitely. That's the, definitely. That's the engagement with stakeholders and, and a step towards the partnering yeah. is you need to be on those, a library needs to be on those committees so that um, they have an opportunity to hear and to contribute, of course. Yep, very important. Hopefully management um, in institutions sees it that way. I mean, library management. Yeah, and it's, that gives us an opportunity to kind of show our value, and because mm. um, otherwise we're not in, even in, at the t literally not at the table. That's it, and no. it also get ourselves involved in working groups as well. Uh, and, the, and one of the hardest things is to know what's going on within your institution, so that you can raise your hand and say this is going on. Mm -hmm. That's a bigger issue. Yes, that's very true, Lucy. I think it's also incredibly valuable that um, the profession not be seen as passive. We ourselves are not passive as individuals, but professionally we might be seen as passive. So when you get invited to the table, definitely go always go in with a value added proposition, prove your worth, demonstrate it, because you can have all the qualifications in the world, but if you're not actually making a value added contribution at the table, mm -hmm. then you can quite easily be uninvited. Mm. Or stereotyped. Uh, yeah, because exactly. There's an assumption at the table that this is what you are. And part of that being at the table initially, from experience, is unpicking that. It isn't necessarily contributing on day one. It's working around with other stakeholders uh, to dispel some of the um, stereotypes uh, yeah. associated with libraries. Oh, you do that? Oh, <laughs> do you? Really? I, th I think we've got to we've got to stop waiting for people to come to us. We have to go to them and show them. What oh yeah, it's, is. Oh, yeah, that's a big collective. big thing. But then it all comes down to the confidence as well. Of well the said. And the training. So we yeah. found that, didn't we, mm. in our survey that some librarians at particular levels, who levels for Australia, were actually having to operate in that environment of. And they obviously, at a Hue 6 or whatever it was, wouldn't have felt overly confident. No, I mean, I mean, for example, at our institution, we're just starting to, to look at promoting open educational resources and the creation of those things. And, and mm. trying to encourage our librarians to go out there and talk to the academics is very difficult. There are different mm. reasons why they find it difficult. But one of those, I think, is not only down to knowledge of that, that area, but also their, their, their level of confidence. They're used to people coming to them or, you know, they, they're used to what they know, but to train them on something new and, and get that confidence only comes with time. Yes, and experience. Mm. Mm. And finding, if they're lucky enough to find a champion within, I'm going to say the institution, yeah. not mm. library necessarily, but someone else uh, can also 
Help. You always that's, need it. That's a whole other business. That you need two, at least two people. <laughs> this is it. Yeah, you need at least two people. Someone who's got the idea and someone that supports them and can, you know, yeah. push that agenda. There's a lot that could be said on that, but we will <laughs> that today. <laughs> Well, I do know did the clock's just ticked over to to one o'clock, um, so that's the end of our, our hour. Um, that's a shame. Lots, sorry, I mean, if I guess if people want to keep going, they we, I'm happy to stay on and, and keep the room open. Um, if there's if there's more to discuss, but I, I figured I'd jump in just in case people do have to to dash off. I know. Mm. Lots of so, other so getting back to what what we do about upskilling, how we can go about doing that. Yeah, so I think I think there's two, you know, and, and uh, these were the conversation. I'm part of something called the Open Research Competencies Coalition in the UK because I started raising these questions um, about well, what I found was I was employing um, non-librarians in my team. And so um, that's when I started sort of, I, I did a couple of workshops where I got a whole lot of job descriptions for Skullcom areas and asked the groups to analyse them for what they thought were traditional library skills, what they thought were new ones and what they thought was personal stuff like you know the need to to be an advocate for example like what we've just been talking about and um the the, the, the traditional library skills were very much a minority in these job descriptions and that opened up a conversation so this this group um the open research Co competencies coalition is it's sort of made up of a whole bunch of different organizations like research libraries uk and jisc and scona which is the scholarly and communication research uh, uh, universities library i can't remember anyway um so all, all sorts of different organizations um that are vitae uh, that that are kind of part of the ecosystem associated with training and professional development and, and formal learning um to try and sort of work something out and we've been talking about this since 2017 and still haven't come up with a solution so mm -hmm. it's not easy um, but we have got two cohorts. We've got people coming through the system. So we'd like to give them a good grounding so that we have, we're future proofing ourselves. Because if those people 20 years plus are all retiring, it's not just opening up new spots. It's also loss of a lot of knowledge. Um, so we've, we've, we're, we're walking potentially into a bit of an abyss at a time when we really, really need that knowledge. Um, so how do, we, how do we deal with our current cohort? Well, the difficulty I think you've got as well is that a lot of libraries, librarians um, or graduates don't know what they want to do. They just want to get into a library. It's not until later on that they find that, for example, I started off as a, in a corporate library and then oh. now I've moved to a whole different area, which is the other end of the spectrum for me, oh. which is uh, higher education and institutional library. And I have to oh. learn that side of things. So um, it, uh, maybe maybe there need to be two things. One is that uh, you know librarians do a generic uh, course and then they specialise. They have the option to specialise, or graduates can come back and complete that module if they need to. Uh, and that can only be done inside of the office. You have to get yourself out there. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point, and that's what we've tried to do with our degrees: is do a basic core and then uh, offer specializations in certain areas mm. um but uh, you know at this point we haven't really done the skull comms thing i think we're doing the data management thing quite well at the moment but not the um skull comms mm. the other option is that most universities you, you know if, if you can do individual subjects of studies you know the issue is the fee but you do get like a formal recognition so as I did that when I was um, a professional, I would go back and just do one subject. I actually went back and did veggie maths when I became responsible for a budget. Um, and so there are there are things that um, th there are different options that uh, that um, all levels of education and practice can be involved in. I mm. think, and yeah. we need because people are at all different stages in there work and learning journeys we need to offer all of those i think so yeah um, different options. So, yeah and uh, and i do think that somebody said earlier um i think it might have been liz stokes that you know um it is uh important also that organiz big organizations little ones can't do it but that big organizations um can have a role like university libraries can have a role yeah. to play in the professional development of their staff as well or yeah. A bigger organization even like maybe call or something something like that you know um so it's an interesting area to tease that's out. true that is true um I I, oh, sorry i was just thinking Lucy, that observation that you just mentioned about um not not even really knowing about it this has come up with the uk call group um 
which is um, that they, they do sort of careers fairs and things over there um, mm. for, um, you know, and, and there isn't kind of a scholarly communication kind of, you know, banner. Researchy, research. Um, yeah, and so uh, and so that's when we started asking these questions about what are the numbers, because if, if, if we're able to say, guys, this is where things are going, this is where this is where the increase, certainly in the UK it is, this is where the mm. increase in librarian jobs are. Yep. If you want to have a job that's future proof, mm. um, don't go into cataloging. This is where you need to be looking. Um, but no one's sort of talking to them in that in that way about, you know, like just, you know, calling at the street and calling people in off the street saying, yeah. come and come with us. Um, yeah, so so there is it's 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 multifaceted, I think. Um, this this whole area about even the problem about even being recognised as an area. Do we not have like a you know like the students can go to a to the to the uh, a website or and and have a look at what the courses are available and it it can provide context around you know this is uh, you know the most up to date you know this is this is where the developments are in librarianship. You really need to focus on academic and you know uh, scholarly. Um, studies, um, sorry, higher education studies, and in particular scholarly communications and that sort of thing. So they have a bit of context about, you know, the current environment where things are heading. So they they have they're better informed and a better choice uh, as to what they they might want to do, and and not just maybe at that point, but just you need to you need to find out where the where the potential students are going to go to find this information and have that information there for them. So not just the fairs, but on the websites and and that sort of thing. Maybe someone they need to talk to if they need to. Yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> yes and yes and no. But <laughs> um, uh, I can't really answer that at the moment, Lucy. So <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I think um, Ainsley was trying to say something a little bit earlier. Is it? Still oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think I think we might have moved on past it, but I was just going oh, to. Oh, sorry um, about that. <laughs> that's right. No, I was just going to agree with what you were saying about um, the difficulty of specialising at you know in, in a basic LAS degree because yeah I was in the same boat it's like look I, I want a job I have no idea what area I want to go into I, mm. I I don't want to you know I don't want to qualify myself out of a particular job you know I don't want to specialize in in academic librarianship if the jobs that are available are in public libraries yeah. or in a school yeah. library um we, you know and the specialisations are fine if you're in the situation where you're already working in a library and you need to then get the qualification. And there are plenty of people who are in that situation. But um, I think someone said earlier that, yeah, you, you go, like someone's just said, you, you go where the jobs are. Mm. Um, so the basic degree and then maybe micro-credentials on top of that. Mm. Um, I've recently been in the situation now where I'm looking at the, um, because I did my degree, I came out with the graduate diploma. And I'm looking now at, okay, what, are, what options are available at master's? And there's some stuff that specialises in the area I'm interested in now or that I'm looking at working in now. And that's, that's another potential option. But um, I think, sorry, the other thing I wanted to say was I think one of the difficulties as well with getting in at, um, getting, to, getting your feet under the table at university is well, partly the, I'm not sure about all universities, but where I was working, the number of um, research library staff was being cut right down. And so we were all being expected to pick up new subject specialisations at the same time as keeping up the scholarly communication knowledge. And it's very difficult to get in with the researchers if they perceive you as not having that uh, subject knowledge. But if Okay, I'm going to use my situation as an example. I was working mostly with engineering and sciences. And then in the last year, I was also assigned to education, architecture, and music. And that's a lot of different specialization to try and get across in a short time in order to appear to have any sort of credentials, which is so what you were saying about imposter syndrome really resonated with me. Um, and also the fact that scholarly communication works differently in those different fields. So it's not just scholarly communications it's how does the different subject affect what you're talking about because my first time speaking with um, arts staff and coming at it from someone who'd been used to working with the engineers and the scientists that was memorable it's a big that I don't know what I don't know what the solution is to that apart from hire more staff but then you've 
you know, so many universities are just not in a position to do that. We are in a fairly unique position where we do have to learn all those new things, whereas, you know, yes. our researchers don't need to, they just need to build on what they know. Mm. Um, so. Yeah, and, and and there is also the question when it comes to some of this Skullcom stuff about, um, you know, you get, and I've had it often, um, well, what do you know? And the answer is more than you about this. <laughs> and, and it's true, I do know more than them about this. Um, and it's sort of, but, you know, I've, I've been working in this space for a long time. I have a PhD in this area. Um, so I know I'm not everybody, but it is, a, a, it, it, this, this is what we've got to really try and instill in our community is that this, this is itself its own area. A lot of people, and then Marianne and I've worked on this particular issue multiple times about the, because, because people are practitioners in scholarly communication, they write papers, they do peer review, they editing, they're doing editing and so on. They think they know about it as a in a, in a holistic sense, and they don't. It, it's like I know teaching. I went to school, um, and so so when we're looking at it as in in and of itself as a, as something, we are experts in this area. And some people are really, really experts. Some people are just starting on that expertise, but guaranteed their knowledge is probably higher than the people they're speaking to. And we've got, that's, that's the confidence question about this particular aspect of what we're doing. We need to try and instill in everybody is that you're all bloody awesome for doing this work. Mm -hmm. Good on you. And you've, you've made the effort. You've had the conversations. You've had those, those horrible experiences where you've been shouted down or stared down or made to feel bad in those conversations. And every time that makes you more of an expert. And so I think that's really important. And that's what we really need to hold on to as a community as that we are fantastic. And I think that that's really important to remember. And very agile and flexible yeah. and all the rest of it. Well, that seems a good note to me to wrap up, a nice positive <laughs> message to finish off with. Um, so thanks again to, to Marianne and Joanna and Danny for their, uh, for their work and their presentation and for agreeing to come along today to this, uh, this six research seminar. Um, thank you all for, for coming. I think that's the highest attendance at one of these seminars I've seen for, for, for a few years. So um, thanks all for coming. Um, and I know that the, we will have a recording of this session um, available. So maybe I'll work with Danny and Marianne so that we can send that out to people who who couldn't make it um but uh, thanks again for for coming thank you simon thanks, thanks thank you. Simon. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone everyone for coming thanks. and for your awesome comments yeah fantastic conversation thank you yeah, yeah exceeds expectations thank you yay